Hey, I finished the last segment at the vestigial structures, which is the number three uh, evidence for evolution. Uh, vestigial structures are teeny tiny remnants some uh, animals have. Uh, we call them vestiges, which I don't anymore use. They don't use anymore. Uh, like one of the good examples is our bone, uh, tailbone, um, and our appendix. The tailbone is not used anymore, you know, but if you fall on it, it's going to hurt really bad. So you wonder why do we have that since we don't have tail anymore. But that just proves that we had an ancestor which used to have tail. Um, like we have similar vestigial structures like in whales and snakes. They have the remnants of their uh, hind legs. And uh, if you look at the horse or the dog, they have remnants side toes. Um, the vestigial structure basically inherited from ancestor uh, where these structures were actually useful. They actually actively used them. So this is basically a proof of evolution, if you, if you uh, wish. This here just shows uh, vestigial organs, uh, hide leg, leg bones on veil, fossils right there. Number four is the embryonic history. Uh, as we know, all vert vertebrate embryos start out very, very similarly. Every single vertebrate embryo has gill slits and long tail inherited from ancient ancestors. Uh, so the statement came around that it seems like that the embryonic development repeats evolutionary history. The idea of this uh, was uh, brought up by Haeckel, Ernst Haeckel, who studied embryology of every different kind of animals. And it's really amazing. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here. Uh, this one uh, shows a couple of embryos. Uh, like right here, uh, this one is a turtle. turtle and the lower one is a chick. So you can see that at the beginning they look really, really alike. You cannot tell them apart. Uh, so the only time they look uh, different is like almost the end of the development, the ontogeny. And this one here shows uh, at the same stage of the fish, reptile, bird and human embryos. It's it's amazing how similar they are. Like if you were given uh, these things under a microscope, you couldn't tell which one is human, which one is, is reptile or bird. So it's very, very interesting. And this is what Hackle and Hackle come up with, that the ontogeny uh, recapitulates uh, evolution. Uh, this here is Ernst Hackle's figure uh, where he uses more different animals, as you can see. And, you also see that the first stage, they are so extremely similar that no one can tell them apart, actually. The only time you can tell them apart is right uh, toward the end of their development. So this is the um, the famous thing, Ernst Haeckel, who come up with this. And he said that the this is just stating that the ontogeny is the species pattern of development and the phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species. So basically, when you have the ontogeny, your, um, the ontogeny recapitulates the evolution, basically. Number five is biogeography. Biogeography, I think that's better to say it that way. Uh, that is about the, the fact that many continents on many continents, unrelated animals evolved to occupy very similar ecologic niches. Um, so that just means that in different uh, continents, you got different types of animals which develop very similar physical features. Uh, for example, uh, the marsupials in Australia versus the, the placental mammals in Europe and, uh, and uh, Africa. So here is the picture right here. Uh, on the left side, you can see the marsupials, and on the light, right side, you can see the, the placental mammals, and you can uh, kind of see that they are really, really, really similar. They have very similar features, I should say. And these guys are marsupials, which means the baby is growing in the pouch right there, like the kangaroo. 
and uh, these guys are marsupials, which means the baby is, is growing in the uterus in them. And the baby is quite capable when they're born, whereas these babies cannot do anything, so they have to be in the pouch basically for a long time. So number six is the fossil record. Uh, the fossil record is very important uh, evidence. Uh, if you think about it, the layers of rocks are containing fossils, and then new layers cover older layers, and um, it creates a record over time. Like if you go to the Grand Canyon, the fossils are going to be different from layer to layer. So it basically records the evolution. So it also shows us how many different organisms have lived on Earth at what time period. So it's kind of interesting. And this just shows you the fossil record, which documents evolution through geologic time. So the fossils will tell us the story, how old Earth is, how old life is, and life on Earth has changed uh, forever and ever. So this takes us to the basis of evolution. Um, you know, the unifying uh, principle of common descent that emerges from all the foregoing uh, lines of evidence um, is being reinforced by the discoveries of modern biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, it is very interesting that uh, the first person who worked on uh, the first person who worked on this uh, have done the the basic work on, on genetics and have come up with a whole lot of knowledge about it, but uh, Darwin didn't know about it. Darwin didn't know that there actually there is an explanation how these things happen. Um, but Gregor Mendel, the, the man who figured out the genes and how important um, rule they have in evolution, sent his paper to Darwin, but Darwin had never opened it. He died without knowing about it. So Gregor Mendel is the father of genetics. Uh, he was actually, very interestingly, he was a Augustinian, he was a monk. Uh, he was born in 1822 in Moravia, what is now the Czech Republic. Uh, he he entered the monastery when he was 22 years old and uh it's pretty crazy because you know when somebody is in the monastery i mean what do you do so his hobby was uh gardening and basically he did studies in so-called plant hybridization and he proved the existence of paired elementary units of heredity which we call now genes and established the statistical laws gover governing them. It's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, he used a different color pea, pea plant uh, to, to do his research. So he was really good. So let's talk about the genes and chromosomes. The cells of organisms, every organism, are contain a thread-like structure, what we call chromosomes. Chromosomes are complex, double-stranded helical molecules of deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, the DNA, you all know, probably you know more about it than me, because like the, the least amount of um, knowledge I have in biology, because I, I started to to learn to be a geologist when I was 14. So I didn't really learn biology, I learned paleontology, which is about fossils. Um, so the specific segments of the DNA molecule are the basic hereditary units, which we call genes. And this slide just shows you uh, a picture of, of a long piece of DNA and when you look at these little rectangles, those are basically the genes. If you look at these uh, genes under electron microscopes, uh, genes and chromosomes, the chromosomes have the shape of letter X. Sometimes though, they look like the letter Y, as in human males. The general lure 
uh, rule is that the more chromosome species have, the more complicated or developed it is. Like if you think of fruit flies, they only have like four chromosomes, but humans have 46. And um, every single species have a certain number of chromosomes and that will not change. It's always going to be the same. But different species have very different number of chromosomes. Uh, the chromosomes usually work in pairs. Therefore, each human cell will have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That, that puts together the 46 we have. In each pair, one comes from the male parent and the other one comes from the female. And that's what makes all that uh, differences among humans because there is not two which will have exactly the same type of uh, uh, chromosomes. Uh, each chromosome contains hundreds, sometimes thousands of smaller pieces of information we call genes. And this is just a picture of the 23 pairs of chromosome. And you can see the, the Y right here, the male chromosome, and the, the X, the female chromosome. When you have sexually, I accidentally uh, re, re, um, took off a slide, but you will see it on your slideshow. If you have sexually producing organisms, the production of eggs and sperm results when parent cells undergo a special type of cell division, and we call it meiosis. Uh, during meiosis, each egg and sperm will only contain uh, half of the chromosomes. So that means every sperm and every egg will only have 23 chromosomes. But when they become fertilized, when the egg becomes fertilized, it will contain all 46 chromosomes and starts to do a cell division, which we call mitosis, that does not reduce the chromosome number. So from, from the egg, which gets fertilized, every single cell will have uh, 46 chromosomes but the eggs and the sperm only have 23. This is very important because this is how life starts. You know, you've got the sperm and the egg get together. Sperm has 23 from the uh, father, egg has 23 for, from the mother, and when they get together, you're gonna have the fertilized egg with 46 chromosome. And from then on, every single cell division will have all 46, and we call that mitosis, mitosis. And uh, this is what uh, I just told you now, that all subsequent division occur via, via mitosis, and each cell that form gets the full complement of 46 chromosomes. So here is the genetic vocabulary you will have to know. You have to know what is a phenotype. Phenotype is the observable characteristics of an organism. Then the genotype is pair of alleles present in an individual. The allele variant forms of the same gene. Different alleles produce variation in inherited characteristics, such as your eye color or your blood type, and so on. Then homozygous, two alleles of trait are the same, YY or Y, small y, small y. And then you have the heterozygous, and that's when you got two alleles of trait which are different, like capital Y, small y, and uh, the capitalized traits are the dominant phenotype, and lowercase traits are the recessive phenotypes. So these are the, this is the vocabulary we all should know, and uh, I guess you mostly know it because you have learned in biology in high school. So the next slide shows Mendel's uh, experiment with the pea plants, and uh, they don't we don't show it with uh, capital Y and small y, but P because he was working with with pea plants. So when when he first had the the pea plants and they were all purple and there was one uh, white, and this shows you the the lettering of them right here. And I guess I'm going to stop right here. So I'm continuing uh, in the third segments right from here. So bye for now.